and Clark Dodsworth is VP of Product Marketing for Chimera Systems. Clark does technology and product strategy. He is one of the original creators of the Philips Ambient Intelligence Concept and Strategy. And actually, I was at the event, the Philips event in um, London. Uh, uh, they, they do these 10-year, like predicting the future for the next 10 years, and it's an amazing scene, and I saw some of this there. Um, and he designed uh, a context-aware mobile system from, uh, for D Dubai land in 2007, uh, just before the crash. Yes, this was, it was an amazing event, that. It was just before the crash, and it was one of the most luxurious events you could even imagine. Uh, so, Clark, take it away. Thank you. We'll, we'll see if we've got some um, imagery up here first. Thanks, Tish. Yeah, um, this has been augmented reality for the whole conference. What I'm going to talk about is how reality can augment us and use the same technologies. I've been thinking about this for quite some time. Um, ambient intelligence, that concept was developed as a result, much derivation from Mark Weiser and his associates, but we developed it in 98 for Philips. That's been adopted by plenty of people since then, and Philips worldwide since then as well. But um, the point of ambient intelligence was for better awareness of what you need to be aware of, and those things and entities in your environment, physical or not, having an awareness of your needs, your goals, your desires, your intent, and taking it from there. Um, so that's what I'll be talking about here. Before we get, uh, get started, I wanted to find out, first of all, how many people are technologists here in the audience? Raise your hand, please. Uh-huh, certainly more than half. And um, how many would you say are non-technologists, and then is there a third group? No, okay. Um, so I'll be talking about what information we deliver through the same augmented reality hardware you've been talking about for two days. Um, and how and why. So the information, there's too much of it. Context awareness is one of the best ways, perhaps the best way to deal with it. Um, so we're talking about a funnel and how to filter with that funnel and use full context awareness, not what's currently being called context awareness. That's a small, small piece. So first of all, we're talking about location awareness and things like that, but location to me is not X and Y coordinates lat long. It's really any set of identifying data points in any number of dimensions of contextual space. If you think about it that way, then it becomes very general purpose. And it can also apply to whatever data you need to know. That's the simplest definition I know of for context awareness. The awareness of whatever you need to know, when you need to know it, and the other category is the kind of data that you yourself generate and how that informs the evaluation of your intent and your goals, your focus and your needs. So we'll be talking about funneling and how best to do it, how to change some of the models that are being used right now. Uh, primarily because we've proven that the way we process data right now, each and every one of us, doesn't really work. We can't keep doing it the way we're doing it. It's a bit too much information, including a quote here from IBM, what we don't need is any more information that we didn't ask for. So we need ways to make that happen that we don't manage. That's the point. Context awareness should be aware enough to manage an awful lot of what we need before we decide we need it. And that means all dimensions in all directions and any data type at any time. Place is very fundamental, but the other dimensions are crucially important and one can build a lot more on top of them. Now the way you do any kind of good context awareness services requires three different things. You need hybrid inputs, really fast and highly parallel ones, but hybrid inputs, not just one or two data types, not calendar plus location or things like that. Secondly, you need, again, hybrid, redundant, mutually supportive methods of analytics, some in the cloud, some on your device, some who knows. But the third thing then is also your display methods, and that's what most of the people came here to talk about and to hear about, glass and other methods for display. But display is just the end point of all the hard work that I want somebody to do for me so that I get the information I need exactly when I need it without having to invoke it, without having to invoke and break 
my state and invoke another state of searching. I want to come to me. I don't want to have to talk to Siri unless there's a darn good reason because the services like Siri, it's possible, it's doable to not have to ask them for an awful lot of things. And we have models, models of awareness. Since about 2001, there's been plenty of really valuable work, usually live, real-time fMRI analysis of what somebody's doing, what somebody's brain is doing, what portions are active when they're engaged in some kind of a process, task, thought. Um, we're moving along rapidly now, but the model of brain function that has to do with personal awareness and state awareness around you is very helpful for some of the AI that's being done for context awareness. So we've got an example here. Um, a rabbit, we think about them as having big ears. They're aware, but they're also food. It's not just ears. They have to be extremely aware. They have to have hybrid methods of context awareness. Their s sense of smell is really good. They're also very, very careful. And they prefer to come out at night. But look at their eyes. Their eyes are like any predator species on the sides of their head. So that gives them a really, really wide field of view, unlike ours as predators. More than that, however, I didn't know this until relatively recently. The way their eyes are set, they have stereo vision too. It's really hard for this kind of a prey species to have stereo vision, but they have it above their head. Where those two fields of view intersect is in a cone above their head. So they can see something approaching from above. Laterally, they can see uh, land predators, but they can also see flying predators really, really, really well. That's what I talk about, hybrid context awareness. That's how you survive to reproduce, and rabbits have learned how to do that really well. So in this case, I was taught this uh, personally. I was out in the middle of a cornfield harvesting it quite a long time ago, and it was the last of the cornfield. There was almost no corn left in the middle of the autumn in Illinois, and the uh, sky was blue, and there were hawks circling, and they were watching, because as I'm going through the last of the cornfield, there's, there are a couple of pheasants and some rabbits and quail running along ahead of me because they didn't have any place left to hide. They were going to have to break and run for the fence way over there to uh, stay in cover. But the distance is pretty dangerous from where I'm making the corn go away with my combine. I'm harvesting it very rapidly at about three miles an hour, but for the rabbits it was fast. And they're running along ahead of me. And finally one of them burst out and took off for the fence as fast as he could. And he was zigzagging, that's what rabbits do, it's another method of staying alive. And a hawk dropped on him. I'd never seen it before, that's the hunting method. They just dropped, they straight down. And very fast, very, very uh, focused and intent. And the rabbit looked like he was a goner. Then I found out what that hybrid ability for context awareness did. The stereopsis that that rabbit has and all the other rabbits have allowed him to calculate the speed of approach of that hawk so quickly that at the very, very, very last millisecond, that rabbit jumped straight up in the air six feet. Startled the hawk, hawk hits the ground, rabbit keeps on running, gets away. It was extraordinary. It startled me as much as the hawk. And you can't do that with only one method of context awareness. You can't survive. And we also can't just manage to swim through the data that we are interested in, not to mention all the data we don't want and all the advertising every day, unless we use methods as powerful, as redundant, and as strong as these biological models. Context awareness has to always be on. And if we have hybrid sensing, we need hybrid methods of response. We also need to have hybrid methods of display. I'm just surprised that to this day, everybody isn't wearing some kind of a Bluetooth earphone because the visual display method is, it's really not suited for an awful lot of applications where some kind of a whisper interface would be an awful lot better. And animals live in the present. So any context awareness methods have to be about this very moment if they're going to work as well as the biological models do. Um, I don't want to have to touch and tap and talk to my glasses. I want them to know what I need right now. So if your phone is going to be in your pocket and it's going to be doing an awful lot of master censoring for you, and if you've got cloud AI mediating between your phone and all the sensors on every other phone, 
most of them being around you, because what that does is it senses reality farther away from you. It extends your senses, which is how we can have reality augmenting us instead of holding up a device with a display to augment reality. I prefer reality augmenting us as a way to think about the problem. No matter what you think about it, it's going to happen. It has to happen. It's the only way we're going to move forward through all this data. And if we're going to do it properly, we have to have user control of their own data, which is the opposite of what all the major players are doing right now. Although I believe that Google is completely aware that this is going to have to change and evolve. So they'll move that way, even though they're doing so much work with gathered data about users now. I believe they'll be out ahead and start providing this kind of an inverted model. And as long as any vendor wants to go through Google, they can do that. But there's an opportunity for other companies to provide that same kind of service, inverting the model, putting, making it user-driven, user-intent-driven as an alternative to going through Google and some of the other major players. If each individual has control of their data and monetization ability of their data, then a great many good things can happen for everybody. This is the way I define context awareness types. And we can start out with location and identity and move up. Um, at the top, I've been thinking and working a lot with Chimera Systems on how you do data brokerage between individuals and vendors. And it doesn't have to be an advertising-driven model at all. In fact, the model is the opposite of advertising. It's more like, come here, I need this now. These are the versions of the data, the types and layers of data that come in to you. The other types are the ones that you generate one way or another. You are creating data, but you also have data coming in. Every one of these layers, when added with the others and properly analyzed with user permission, is a way to build services. And the more layers you use, the more revenue opportunity you have. So if you've got all this data, what well, the best way to access it and the best way to know what's relevant and who will use it, how will they use it, and how to manage that volume uh, will lead to solutions that are way, way, way beyond personalization as we think of it today. Um, it's going to change how I work every day. It's going to change my leisure time, my weekends, my my day and night life when I'm not working, and it's going to radically change commerce. I don't think that there's any way around this happening. If we start out with all that contextual data, all those eight layers of contextual data for every one of us in the room and everybody else, and then derive from it by whatever means you want, whether it's analytics or a variety of other methods, including the one that Chimera Systems does, if you can find intent, that's the lever, that is a fulcrum upon which you can actually do something. But right now, the people that are talking about context awareness are up at the top of the screen. It's mostly about notification, calendar plus location, that sort of thing. Uh, so notification is great, but it's really, really small. It's just one small part of genuine, full context awareness. Um, the people that are doing it, uh, the people that are aware enough of it, uh, are the OS people. They get it. Context awareness is going to get pushed down the stack, and that will be a requirement. It will be absolutely just assumed by any buyer of a mobile device in um, maybe three years at the most. Um, meanwhile, there are some other players too. Nigel, the bottom center one, is the software that my company, Context Awareness, has come up with. And if you have gathered the right information and processed it well and discovered intent about a person or about yourself or about some other entity, then you have the ability to control a variety of things, sourcing information, sourcing services, but also you can control things that that individual whose information you understand may not want you to control. And that's where the context war comes in. And it's been called a variety of other things, but I've thought about it as a context war for a long time and it has a great deal to do with AI coming out of Park coming, coming out of SRI, and um, every one of these three major players, I don't think we can even count Microsoft and Nokia anymore, are pursuing the winning the context war as hard as they can every day. If you have a managed device platform, you can provide the full range of services. 
So um, the alternative is this. And I don't think any of us want that. We don't need people knowing too much about us. So if we do have AI-driven context awareness, and if we're using it for our own benefit, if these services are available, whether they're in your OS or elsewhere, whether they're cloud delivered, if that's helping us get through our, our day, it's also helping retail. It's helping retail a lot. So everybody wins, really. Um, and the simplest way I can describe it and summarize this talk is that if you can determine salience, if you can have a third party who is disinterested in not selling things to people and determine salience of the intent in the moment of an individual and a retailer and any other kind of entity that has goals, that carries intent, integrate those in the cloud, then you can do brokerage. And everybody can split the profit that formerly went to advertisers. That seems like a good solution to me. Thanks. <laughs>